The largest element of the first and second Death Stars was its massive super laser housed inside the battle station superstructure. This video explains how the super laser operated and also how it drew upon the massive amounts of energy required to allow the battle station to operate. The source material is mainly from Legends but I also added some elements from Canon 2. For more future Imperial Explained videos please give a like and subscribe to this channel. The Galactic Empire's super laser energy was generated at the centre point of the battle station's hypermatter reactor core, which generated massive amounts of energy to its primary and field amplifiers, which was channelled into eight tributary beam shafts for the first and nine for the second Death Star. The tributary beam shafts were accelerated and amplified by gigantic focusing magnetic lenses and coils, producing a single central powerful beam which would strike the target. In Legends, the super laser's energy source was drawn from an energy crystal acquired originally from a project ordered by Chief Palpatine called Project Hamatong. The mission successfully removed a huge energy crystal which belonged to the intergalactic banking clan on the planet Megito and was used for the first Death Star. In canon, crystals known as Kyber crystals held concentrated energy in a unique manner through the Force. The Empire looted many of these crystals from across the galaxy in order to harness their power. Project Celestial Power was an Imperial program which developed the capability from the crystals for the superweapon. The colossal hypermatter reactor core powered all the Death Star systems including the super laser, the hyperdrive generators, sublight engines, turbo lasers, energy shields and of course life support. The power core distributed energy to the station's rotational capabilities and capacitor panels situated around the reactor's chamber stored and provided energy outward to the onboard systems reaching the Death Star's surface. As well as the immense energy required to drive the main reactor, power could be directed to any interrelated subsystem sections when required. This meant that there was more than enough energy that could be drawn upon from the capacitor panels to sustain the station's onboard systems while a massive amount of power was used to fire the superweapon. However, the first Death Star's hypermatter reactor relied upon a recharge time of up to 24 hours before the station could fire again. The second Death Star, due to its larger size, housed a more sophisticated hypermatter reactor than the first with an advanced transference subsystems assembly. This allowed the reactor to recharge the superweapon in a matter of minutes by drawing upon considerably larger capacity to generate and store energy to operate the superweapon and its onboard systems. This is the reason why the second Death Star could fire multiple times in a short space of time with a recharging period of just a few minutes. The station's hyperdrive capability demanded over 100 hyperspace generators which communicated with its central navigational matrix. The navigational databanks contain the coordinates for thousands of star systems inside Imperial space, as well as many other systems the Empire wished to conquer. The station's technicians and engineers monitored the hyperdrive control stations to ensure the power core readouts were in sync as the Death Star travelled through hyperspace. When out of hyperspace, the station's external propulsion thrust was generated by its powerful ion sublight engines in order to achieve the motion required to move the Death Star's huge mass. The ion engines situated around the circumference at each pole were powered from the reactor core which converted the raw fusion energy into the necessary thrust through space. Across the Death Star's vast surface, a network of city areas were situated upon the station's northern and southern hemispheres. In order to protect these structures, typically three shield protection towers generated energy shields over a designated area. Although the shields were weak to defend against energy weapons, they were generally effective protection against space debris. However, the most heavily shielded section of the Death Star housed the Emperor's Throne Room. Next in the series, I will focus on the subject of the second Death Star. If you are interested in more Imperial Explained videos, please check out my channel. For more future Imperial Explained videos, please give a like and subscribe. Thank you for watching, and as always, long live the Empire.